to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Jamie. Welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. We are doing something super special today because my guest says he's never done this before. And really, honestly, neither have I. So thanks for listening to every previous episode, downloading our episodes, leaving your reviews on Apple Podcasts. You are helping make the Fit and Fabulous podcast one of the top 15 podcasts on Apple Health. So thank you so much. So today's podcast, we're actually on location at Upgrade Performance Institute in Elkhorn, Nebraska, which is a uh, a new uh, business that my husband and I, don't worry, I'm just getting poked with needles right now. If you guys hear me uh, stutter at all, one of, our, one of our nurses here at Upgrade is actually starting an IV. So the cool part, people on YouTube are watching us, Tom, but uh, we both have IVs and we're getting IV NAD therapy while we are doing this podcast. So I wanted my guests to experience all things here at Upgrade Performance <laughs> Institute. So I made him do pain. a DEXA scan. Now we're doing IV NAD therapy. Uh, but my, my guest today is Tom Shea. And if you guys don't know who he is, Tom Shea served for 23 years with distinguished valor as a Navy SEAL. During his military career, he served in three wars, ultimately leading a team of Navy SEALs into Afghanistan in 2009, where he earned a silver star, bronze star with valor and army commendation with valor, his second combat action medal. Um, he is also the CEO of his business, Adamantine Alliance. I have gone through Tom's training and it is phenomenal. He lives in Greenville, South Carolina, which I think is the cutest little town I've ever is seen, this? Tom. I visited recently and was, was pretty, uh, pretty swoon with Greenville, I won't lie. He is married to his wife, Stacy, and he's got three children, but he's the author of Unbreakable. And that's how I met Tom Shea was a friend of mine sent me Tom's book and I started reading it and it's, it's really changed the way that that I have thought about a lot of things and I think that Tom has an important message to share with all of you. So Tom, thank you for coming. Well, I would have said thank you back, but I'm beginning <laughs> to feel a little nauseated over here. <laughs> okay, so those of you that don't know, uh, we're, we'll talk about it. I guess we can just talk about it right now. So, uh, and then we'll get back to how cool Tom is. <laughs> but, I was cool until this moment in time. Yeah, Tom and I are doing something called IV NAD therapy and NAD stands for nicotinamide um, adenine dinucleotide. So that's just a super fancy term uh, to talk about NAD, which is a coenzyme and it binds to different things in our body and it goes into our mitochondria and makes cellular energy. So many of us are NAD depleted. Tom and I work busy, stressful lives. So this NAD is going to replenish the energy in our cells, Tom. So you're gonna feel, you're gonna feel more unbreakable feel this, this after terrible. the podcast. <laughs> But what, Tom, good. what Tom's referring that. to is that NAD, as it's going in and the cells are taking it up, people, ex they have an experience when they do NAD, which I think is kind of cool um, because it's one thing to not feel anything, right? But when you can feel it, I feel, well, I don't know, maybe I'm just making that up, but you don't feel great. So you can get a little nauseous. So if Tom or I pass out or puke <laughs> or something during this podcast, then we only apologize. Here, only here, We fellas. apologize. But the people on YouTube can see we've got these uh, bags of saline hung here with NAD in it. And we're going to we're gonna be getting this NAD the whole, the whole time here. Um, okay, so Tom, mm. um, tell, us about, tell us about Unbreakable. Tell us about your career with the Navy SEALs and how Unbreakable and Three Simple Things really ever came to fruition. Well, you... Uh, the funny, the, one of the funniest things to talk about while you're getting NAD and you're feeling nausea is how you kind of started your a career. So I went into SEAL teams uh, a little later in life. I had gone to West Point and felt out in English. And I, the only thing that somebody can do when they can't read and write well is go into the SEAL team. So I really chose wisely. So I, I went into SEAL teams later, I think when I was 23. And I wanted to be a part of a, a group of guys that don't have excuses. And I really look at it that way. They don't care about uh, anything other than getting stuff done. And I wanted to be in that community. And that was kind of the, the real genesis of the work that I'm now doing in retirement is to teach people the value of uh, doing things that are relevant because you said you would do them, like keep your word, make a promise. And it's just hard to, hard to keep track of that conversation while you're nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lisa. No, I'm good, I'm good. Get I'm this just, man some, yeah. some anti-nausea medicine. No, no, I'm not, 
that's more in my chest than it is. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So like I said, people experience like chest heaviness, tightness. I promise you're not having a heart attack. That's fine. Um, when you stop IV NAD, it's my hands. as soon no, as, not shaking. They're as good. soon as the, the drip is done, you essentially feel totally normal. And then over the next 24 to 48 hours, you're going to feel really good. But the loading dose, we typically will do, um, a loading dose every other day for 10 days. And then maintenance is like once a month. So you can take NAD a lot of ways you can take it orally, but the bioavailability is certainly much higher if you do something intravenously. So, but you have to be willing to get poked. That's, you know, the downside of it, but Tom's really brave. Okay. So, uh, you go to the seals, tell us what buds is like. Mm, that's the, the big question. Is Were you scared? Like. Were you scared? Like no. what was your thought? I just love so hearing. I, I how grew up uh, work. being an, uh, an athlete, so I played football in college. I was a track athlete. I thought I, I thought I was in good shape, and then you show up to a program where the instructors are at a higher level than you thought possible. And so, Buds is a, a six-month-long program that weeds out all the people who are going to quit on something when it's difficult. <clears throat> and that being the case, we started out. I started out uh, in. Uh, a class uh, numbered 195. And if you ever talk to a SEAL and they don't know their SEAL class number, they're not. So it's one of the indicators is everybody graduates, graduates with a number assigned to them, a class number. I think they're up to like 360 something now. What class were you? I started out with 195 and uh, I made it to Hell Week, which is a, uh, th was the sixth week of training. And that week of training is solely designed to weed out everybody that can't endure can't honor the yucky, word. <laughs> shitty stuff. It's terrible. How many people start and how many people finish? Uh, notoriously, there's an 85% not finish rate. And out of that 85% that start that don't finish, maybe 6% are medical. The rest are quit. And, and most people quit in the first seven weeks around Hell Week is the big quit point. So Hell Week starts on a Sunday night and goes till Friday. And they give you every reason in the world to quit. Like you'll find that they do everything that's the stupidest thing you could possibly do. They freeze you, they confuse you, uh, want you to run two miles with sand in your mouth, all the stupidest things that you could never think about. Why would I do this? They make you confront and they make you confront it with uh, a team of people, mm -hmm. which is even more difficult. Uh, your ability to get along in tough times with other people is a big factor in being successful. And so I started out 195. I get to Hell Week and I got a concussion. I had to start over. How'd you get the concussion? Uh, we are doing a, an event called Rock Portage right in front of Hotel Dell. Whoever's listening to Hotel Dell, look out at the rocks. <laughs> uh, so. It's a, a jetty of rocks that go out that have the breaker that breaks right on the rock. So you have to be able to land your boat on the while it's breaking, get over safely. Uh, and I didn't get over safely. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had to start over in the process starting over. I started 196 from the beginning. I made it to Hell Week again and I dislocated my shoulder. And we were doing a, an obstacle course with a thousand pound boats trying to put push boats over walls and crawl with them and I got caught under the boat uh, and my shoulder fully subluxed and I was able to make it from Tuesday till Wednesday uh, afternoon with a no circulation in my right arm and they're like if you can't get your hand over your head uh, we're gonna pull You're you out. out and I couldn't so they pulled me out and uh, since I wasn't going to quit. They offered me to let yourself heal. You don't have to start the next class, but you, you can start 198. So I started 198, uh, recovered as best I could from a sublux shoulder and uh, um, got pneumonia in Hell Week. And they asked me to quit. And I didn't quit. I like you can start again on Monday. We starting on Monday with mm -hmm. pneumonia. So I, I was in 199, had pneumonia the whole time, and they pulled me out of Hell Week uh, on Wednesday with all, all five lobes, 40% infiltrated with fluid. And I was kicked out of the SEAL program at that point. And I went and worked at a hospital as a corpsman for nine months and finally convinced the admiral of the hospital to send me back 
uh, because if you don't quit, a lot of great things happen. And uh, Right, but I'm over here as a doctor thinking like, you're an idiot. Yeah, I was an idiot. But I, I, I had already failed at something. I'm like, I don't want to go back mm -hmm. home with my tail between my legs having failed. And uh, so I'm like, I'm just going to stay here until I die or make it through. Right. So I made it through class 207. And uh, we started out with 111 and graduated 11. Wow. After six months. Wow. And yeah. A lot of, every SEAL has that same story. Nobody's allowed to do that number of hell weeks anymore because it does brain damage. Really? They're so like, they cut yeah. them off? Yeah, they said. They need NAD. <laughs> so they only, allow, they only allow two tries two, now. Two tries. Yeah. And I, have, I was there five times. And then I had a nice career. I went to SEAL Team 2 first. And then I went back as an instructor in SEAL training uh, after the towers got hit. Mm -hmm. So I was there for three years. Then I went to SEAL Team 7, did several deployments there. And uh, then my final bit was I was in charge of our SEAL sniper course for two years. Yeah. You and I were just talking about this yesterday. You've been out how long now? Retired? Eight. Eight years. What's it like being retired and then watching how things change in the world? Uh, you know, the all the stuff that's going on in, over in uh, Afghanistan, you know, having done a deployment there, uh, as a as a SEAL, if you would have asked me that if I was active duty, I don't care. Because it's just another conflict that's gone bad, another bad decision made. That's what SEALs are there is to overcome all the bad decisions that are made. Mm -hmm. As an adult with my daughter now in the Army, uh, I look at it as it's a crisis that we're all going to feel for the next five to six years. Whatever just happened in, in Afghanistan will affect all of us. Mm -hmm. How it will is to be undetermined. Yeah. Yeah. So you feel different now, like now that you're at home in Greenville, your wife and your kids. It's almost like now you're on the other side of it. And, and now, uh, now I trenches. pay attention to things that I didn't mm -hmm. used to pay attention to. And when you're a SEAL, you're the most isolated group in the world. The only other people you know on the planet are your is your family and the other mm -hmm. team guys that are there. Now that I get out, I get to meet more human beings, you know, like you, and get to realize that uh, there's a lot of negative impact of bad politics. Yeah. Even though you wouldn't think anything in Afghanistan is going to affect you here, it, it ends up affecting us in a myriad of ways. Yeah. Like there's so many parallels and I talked about this on previous podcasts, like being an athlete, there's parallels to life. And like, as I hear you talk about what's going on in Afghanistan, like I'm a healthcare provider in the middle of the worst pandemic in, li in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of with you. I ignore a lot of the noise because I just feel like I'm in the trenches and I'm just going to do my work. I'm going to show up, do my work, take care of the patients. That's all I can do. Um, but sometimes it really is hard. I think in this day and age with media and social media and <laughs> to listen to everybody else's analysis and they've mm -hmm. never been in those shoes before ever yep. and, and never you know, will the be. The fun thing is uh, uh, I, I really think uh, having been all over, the, all over the world, meeting different types of people, different political stuff that you see, uh, the, United States, the United States was designed to be, everybody was supposed to be involved. We were supposed to be involved. The fact that we don't find ourselves as involved makes it easier for bad decisions to have ripple effects. Like literally everybody was supposed to be involved in the whole cycle. Wasn't supposed to be a king making decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm getting a sense of that now that my wife's very politically attuned to what's going on yeah. and hearing what you say and thinking about, gosh, if we don't get involved then something's going to happen that we can't pay attention to like what's going to happen to our kids and, yeah or businesses yeah i remember recently stacy um tom's wife had posted about just getting involved politically like i have no interest in ever running for government or things like that but the truth of it is is it, it affects all of us it does. so if you're a voting citizen i mean you whether you like it or not this is the necessary evil you know, of a democracy and you, you have to get involved. You do at some level. Um, and I'm thankful that there's people like Stacy that are mm. thick skinned enough to yeah. jump in that arena. Yeah. Now it's a, uh, 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 it's 
funny. It's no. I mean, listen, we're sitting here in the most free place in the world socially, mm -hmm. taking care of ourselves, having other people that you're influencing be a part of this conversation. It can dry up in a minute. Mm -hmm. It literally can dry up in a minute if we don't pay attention. Mm -hmm. And even though that wasn't your original question, but. Well, and we're totally getting on a tandem, but I'm, cause you and I talked about this last night. We were talking about how easy life is for so many people these yeah. days. Um, we don't have to hunt for our food. Most people listening don't, they have a house to live in. Um, shoot, you can like Uber Eats your food. Mm -hmm. Our jobs are easy. Computers are doing everything for us. We have artificial intelligence. Like our life is really easy. Yeah. And most people think it's really hard. It's actually pretty freaking easy. And when you do that, I was telling Tom last night, I was reading someone else's book that when you're, when you're succeeding, when life's going pretty well is when you're very vulnerable. And I think that that's where a lot of people have gotten in their life is they're at this level of just like coast and comfort and life's pretty good. I got money in the bank account. I got food in my fridge. And if you don't realize that some of the things that are happening in the world are going to impact you eventually, That's, you know, that you, it's like the, you have to be on the alert. mentality that got me into working with, uh, so it got me into the business world. Well, tell, yeah. So tell us how Unbreakable was, was born and yeah, so kind of led into your I wrote, leadership. So in 2009, the book that Jamie's talking about, uh, I, my wife Stacy had asked me to write down what I wanted to pass on to the kids in case I died in combat, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. Not even listening to myself hear that. Say that, say that out loud. Like, what the hell? Hmm. So I. But that I mean, you might not have came home. I mean, that's the well, yeah, reality so, of going so to war. It was really important for Stacy that my kids get to know me, and as a SEAL, I was gone all the time, even up to that point in time. Mm -hmm. And the kids were at an age where they could understand better that I was a SEAL, I was gone and I could die. And they wanted to be a part of the, the daily conversations that we were having. And Stacey said, man, could you write this down? I'm gonna, you know, every letter that you send or email you send, I'm gonna keep, but make it be something that you want the kids to be able to do or know about you. So 2009 deployment over to Afghanistan where all this turmoil is, uh, was uh, one of the, number one combat deployments in the teams. And what I mean by that is we're in combat once a week for six months where people are shooting at you and you're shooting at them. And every time before I went out, I would write a, an idea to my kids or to Stacy, uh, in case I don't come home, I'd like you to be able to, uh, one, for instance, uh, do something that's scary like rappel down a cliff and climb up the cliff uh, because we were going to go into this mountain region. And I'm like, man, I wish my kids had this opportunity to face fear. Right. So it was a series of what became 13 lessons that I wanted my kids to then know. It wasn't intended to be 13, but it was intended to be for my kids, just for my kids. And the, the title that I was writing towards, towards my kids was Spartan Woman uh, because I know that men of any merit are shit without strong women. Mm -hmm. And I wanted my kids to know that. It didn't make it through the publishing editing process, uh, but it became paramount that I tell my kids that uh, real real stuff about me. And these, that, So these publishers want the world to think that the SEAL is the big yeah, unbreakable yeah, badass. Maybe SEAL, cool. But uh, I, I had, I realized that uh, without a strong uh, marriage at home, men don't do well. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the reasons that I fought really well was get the hell home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that became a book called Unbreakable, which uh, my wife published without my saying yes. <laughs> and uh, Wives are so smart. Yeah. <laughs> so literally, I, I didn't want to be in the public space and it kind of thrust me into that space. And she uh, kept pushing me to go out and speak about it. And it then became a way for me to, what we were talking about earlier is what happens when you're successful is you actually lose traction. Mm -hmm. And most of the, the 
business owners of the United States that I interact with have lost something in the process of, of winning. Either you lose a marriage, you lose your health, uh, you lose some spiritual connectivity or something along those lines and they wanted to get all of it back. So I put, that, put together a program about seven years ago to, to teach leaders how to, I call lead themselves at home and then lead other people because you can't lead other people until you can do yourself first. And uh, it's been a wild ride of being part of the, I call it the human equation, is teaching people how to be better at what they normally can do, mm -hmm. but it's been lost. And uh, Cause I don't know if that's easy. your rendition of the yeah. training, but yeah. <laughs> it's at least the instructor's rendition of the training. Yeah. And the more I've talked with Tom about all the people that he works with, so Tom's kind of concept is he's got these five pyramids. Mm -hmm. So tell people what the five pyramids are. And everybody, everybody will know them after I talk about them. Everybody has these five areas of life that they either don't do well at, but they know about, but they're constantly engaged in. So health is the first area. Uh, your ability to learn is the second area. Your ability to have a job or derive value from what you do is the third. The fourth area are the relationships in your life. And the fifth area is your spiritual connectivity. So those five areas, I designed a articulate training around teaching leaders to get really good in those five areas of their own life. And hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, and so you kind of keyed in on this, is that the relationship pyramid for people mm -hmm. who can be wildly financially successful, mm -hmm. you know, they've got the top CEO job, um, they, hell, they might even be listening to my podcast and they're eating right and moving right and physically fit and they've got all the things, but a lot of times the rate limiting step for them mm -hmm. is relationships, yep. um, especially intimate relationships, yep. their spouse, their wife, their husband, whoever it is. Um, Tom's told me some incredible stories about people he's worked with and like they're on their seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th marriage. Now you obviously have a different perspective you, Stacy is not your first wife. Mm -hmm. You've you've been married previous to that. I. So in the SEAL teams, if you have issues at home and you're in a combat zone, you're asked to leave. Mm -hmm. We knew inherently that if you have any distractions at home, you're better served just to go home and take care of them because you're less of an operator or less of a human while you have issues at home. Mm -hmm. In the business world, it became the same thing, I, unintended. I didn't think I'd be in, the, in any deep conversations with either you or uh, any other business owner about, hey, here's, hey, cool, we can run a business. I can, I can show you how to run a business. That's just a matter of efficiency. But the drain, the drain has always been in the past eight years, what's going on at home that nobody can articulate. Uh, busy, I don't. He does his thing, I do my thing. All that conversation is a distractor mm -hmm. and it doesn't ever promote you. So what I found in all executive, every single executive had the same issue, lack of clarity on how to deal with what's going on at home. And so we just put a, together a program that makes it what simple but not easy. And what I found to be true and what you're going through now is uh, if you can listen to your spouse every day, it's transformative. Mm -hmm. And then you have to committedly say something to your spouse every single day. And then a level of intimacy that is rare. And so I call those, the, those three simple things that you can do in a relationship that profoundly affects not only you, but the people that you interact with. And come to find out, I didn't know that nobody wasn't doing that. Or, they weren't doing that. And it's very difficult for executives or leaders to have that 30 minutes with their spouse. When you have it, everything works out. Mm -hmm. When you don't, everything slips is what you were saying earlier. And uh, now we're in the business of making uh, relationships that are profound at home be the center point of success in, uh, in business. Yeah. 
And that's why you really wanted the book to be Spartan Woman, because that's what you're really saying is that you were successful in those other areas and able to go to war and come back alive because you had that solid relationship. Can people be single? Like, do they need an intimate partner? Like, have you worked with people who aren't in marriages? I mean, what is that dynamic like? Yes, I've worked with uh, many single men and women. The training then provides them access to have it. Mm-hmm. I don't think you, I think you're half the human being if you're not in a significant relationship. Not in, I, you don't have to have kids, right. but you have to be uh, uniquely uh, tethered to another human being to do well, at, at, even at your life. A lot of people don't say that. I don't think, uh, for instance, a successful woman that is single, uh, she's, she's operating half of her, half, half her capacity. Mm-hmm. Why not operate at full capacity? It's because it's freaking hard. Mm -hmm. It's actually harder to have that relationship, but the outcome is uh, more beneficial if you have it. Yeah, I'm definitely stronger because of my partner. I mean, I couldn't have done half the things I did, but we definitely went through years in our marriage where Ben's working, you know, as a police officer, nights, weekend, holidays. I'm working at the hospital 80 hours a week. We have a newborn two year old and four year old. Like, I, I know what those years are life where those years of your life are like where you're just in the trenches and you're yep. just trying to survive and you're not pouring a lot of energy into your relationship. Once you become a parent, I feel like you start to lose and identity in your relationship, oh, yeah. Yeah. especially for women. And you and I have talked about this. Yeah. You've obviously never had a baby, but your body physically changes your brain. Literally the brain chemistry starts changing. Um, and it's like having to reinvent that relationship with your partner all over again. And I think this is just me speaking in my opinion here, but I think relationships these days are so superficial because our life is so easy. You know, a lot of people's relationships like start on Facebook or Tinder, like whatever app it is, like people don't even understand how to sit in two chairs like this and have a deep, meaningful connection. And we're not provided with a lot of opportunities in our day-to-day life to have those, right? We just like order on the Starbucks app and pick it up at the window. And like, we don't even know how to have basic conversations, let alone these deep conversations. No, I think it also affects, uh, so if you didn't have that, so you're a doctor, imagine if you didn't have a connecting relationship at home, this wouldn't be possible. It would be increasingly harder to be fit or even help other people with fitness, which, which to me is the, the, really the nature of, of relationship is it compounds what you can do, mm-hmm. not confines what you can do. Most people, since they don't do the simple things in relationship, it's too difficult. Mm-hmm. So if I have to spend time with you and, and, then, and there's no exchange, it's then just a waste of time, then I don't do it. Then I just, then still just an individual operating around other people. Uh, but what well, I know to be true now with 500 or 400 plus people that have gone through training is the relationship has been the, the, like the pivotal moment in the training where their life gets better is when it gets better at home. Mm-hmm. So you've been through divorce and you've been through separation. How, how do you know when a relationship isn't worth saving? Wow. How do you like, that's a big one. That's because the I've never thing there, Jamie. I'm just going to sit here and pick your brain while I drug you with NAD okay. because I mean, because I, I haven't, I've obviously been through separation. I mean, I've dated people, you know, prior to Ben and, um, I think there's other people in relationship. Like I have definitely, as I have grown emotionally, physically, spiritually, I have marginalized people in my life mm. that didn't bring me energy and value. And so I guess I can even rephrase this. Oh, I have the answer. I was, I was interested in how you were going to Yeah, I mean, step all over your own I self. mean, there's, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, there's people, you know, listening who have been through divorce or maybe they're in a marriage where they want to leave their partner. But I guess like, where is that decision-making process? You're not even close to done. Dude, Quit looking at your IV bag. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, it's fine. Yeah. Do not no, touch good. mine. We're good. Leave. Go somewhere else. <laughs> Tom, if you had to rate NAD zero to 10, what would you give it? This is a, a, as a, I don't give a shit anymore about a seven. Okay. Yeah. So the worse you feel, you probably need it. So this is good for you. 
Oh, I know. Yeah, you're gonna feel really That's, good tomorrow. You keep saying that as much as you want. <laughs> okay, so back to the relate, like. So the, the relationship thing, here's, the, here's how you know you're in a good relationship, is when you can actually articulate what your lover or fiance or girlfriend, boyfriend does on a day-to-day -day basis. I know what you do. You go, you go, you get up, you go for like even Stacy. I know what she does. I don't get a say in what she does. I just know the first level of having a successful relationship is my ability to share what I do with you and you not conflict it. Mm -hmm. Like if I want to be an underwater welder, I get to be an underwater welder around you. If you can have that level of relationship, the, it, most things can handle themselves. So just knowing what the other person does, most That's people don't do that. Yeah, they they have drama. I don't like what Jamie. I don't really like that you're gone all the time. What is she doing today? I don't know, but she's been a doctor, and I don't like it. So most people she's know, gone all the time. Most people know drama, which is uncommitted conversation that you can't do anything about. That's what drama is, mm -hmm. as opposed to. Uh, Ben's, he's out on, you know, when he was a police patrol. officer, he's out on patrol. The funny thing is, ask every person that you know what their husband does. I don't know. He goes to work. It's the level they of clarity. They actually what they do. You know, the, the, if you, the more that you know about your spouse, the easier it is to be in a relationship. Sharing. It's yeah. sharing with yeah. your partner. So and that had that would then denote that it came from sharing. Mm -hmm. So from the outside, just the more you know about your partner, the easier it is to, to be in a relationship. Because as you begin to know more and you don't leave, that's a relationship. And then the second part is the level of uh, contact and intimacy, intimacy that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Even virtual contact or intimacy it, to me is the determining factor of the long-term success of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And when you ask couples, you know, when was the last time you held hands? Oh, we're, we've been married for 30 years, we don't do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like start dating your husband and wife again, because then you get to know them and you have the intimacy that, and you would know as a doctor, physical contact has chemical ramp and yeah. hormonal ramifications. Just touch, like just a hug. One of Ben and I's favorite things to do, I'm sure he'd say have sex, but we literally, our 10 minute share of the day, we literally will just hug, like no words, nothing for like 60 seconds. And he's like, literally, I feel like a feeling mm. in my chest. And I'm like, yeah, it's oxytocin. Like it's a, you, mm. I mean, physical touch. It's just like when a woman has a baby and you put the baby skin to skin on the chest, the, the husband actually can do the same thing. You can take the baby, just delivered two babies today, put them on the chest and literally your brain will start secreting oxytocin which is a bonding hormone it's the biochemical way that you don't abandon your young you know out in the wild it's creating those social bonds so men get this too yes men get this too hmm. and so you can develop i mean that's how that's how like you can even have intimate conversations with people you'll start secreting oxytocin really? so these are hormones that are secreted in response to even just conversation and physical touch. Physical touch, you get a more robust response. So hugging somebody, embracing somebody, having sex, having an orgasm, you release oxytocin. That's where people get the warm and cuddlies after sex. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Tom's never had sex before. I've never, I don't know what um, warm and cuddly is, okay? Just no. What, else, what other, I'm interested in that because I have been uh, in the past eight years banking on intimacy having hormonal response yeah or chemical what else what, what else other than oxytocin gets released when there's touch yeah so we see like vasodilation so we actually see you know like the blood pressure lowers the heart rate now it depends like what type of physical intimacy now hugging is obviously different than having an orgasm but there's a hormonal sure? cascade that happens you know and and it's important, especially for women, this is one thing that I deal with, is women who come in and they've been you know, married for 30 years, but the sexual aspect of their relationship is failing. And sometimes it's one partner, sometimes it's both partners. But I mean, I hear women who are just like, yeah, that's not really part of our relationship anymore. Right. And that's sad to me because it is an important part of our health. 
Um, there, I shared this, uh, well, maybe I didn't share it on social media, but there's literally been studies that have been done that show if you have two orgasms per week, you literally live longer. Like it can change your morbidity and mortality. Mm. So, and I mean, that can be a whole nother podcast, you know, that people can say, well, mammals aren't, you know, meant to have sexual pleasure. It's just for reproduction, whatever. That's like a whole nother thing. Um, but it really has a, an impact on your physical and mental mm. health. And then obviously a relationship. Well, so what, so, uh, if I touch, if a man touches his wife, what re hormonal responses happen? You're going to brush by. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any sort of physical embrace, you're going to get some oxytocin. Okay. Yeah. Which is that bonding hormone. And that's what I'm saying is it's such an important part of social, like the pack, the tribe. Um, it, it's, it's bonding. It's like, it's why the, you know, pack of sheep doesn't leave one sheep by the roadside mm -hmm. because them just being, you know, in a herd and bumping against each other. I mean, they have that, that connection. What, does it also, uh, would it also reinforce like the dopamine drip? Bert, yeah. You know, we've mm -hmm. talked, we've shared, touched. Is that like a dopamine in initiative? Or <laughs> yeah. Not? I mean, you can, so you dopamine, you can get a dopamine response from a lot of things. And back to this idea of people living kind of an easy life. We live such an easy life back when we were more primal and we lived in teepees and had to hunt for our food, we literally got a dopamine response mm. from, you know, uh, chasing, chasing down the well. buffalo. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, I found berries. Ooh, I found a great cave to sleep in. We got small amounts of dopamine response from those things. Yep. Dopamine drives, drives behavior. Mm -hmm. Most people think of it in the world of like pleasure addiction. Mm -hmm. It's actually the dopamine deficiency that drives a lot of behavior. And the problem is, is we don't get this dopamine response from our normal day to day lives because it's so flipping easy mm -hmm. that we have to seek it other ways. Right. We have to look for pornography. We have to use social media swiping to get the dopamine response. We have to do these bigger, crazier, grandiose things to get the dopamine response. And the problem with dopamine is that there's this constant balance in the brain between pleasure and pain. And we'll just call dopamine pleasure, right? So we're like, ooh, that was fun. And so the, what happens as soon as you get that, oh, that was fun pleasure response, you get an equal swing in the opposite way, which we'll call pain. And as humans, we don't like to experience that. So then we press the button again and we do the action again. Well, the more we constantly press that button, we have to press it harder and for prolonged periods of time to get the same response. Mm. And so when we look at people who are like addicts, um, they've been pushing the button so long and hard that it's hard to even go back the other way because the swing the other way is bad. Mm. Whereas us as humans, if we can figure out how to, I don't want to say be bored, but we need to get back to getting dopamine responses from normal human behavior. Mm. Um, and I think that's, what's so interesting, like thinking about your training is, um, getting people uncomfortable <laughs> mm -hmm. because we just live in such a world of yeah, like, I'm just running through my head of wonder, wonder what the reinforcement is that I, you know, I, I, part of the training that you're going through is a, well, you're, you're trying to get people to reinforce the simple things. And that's, it's kind of the same parallels. What I'm talking mm -hmm. about is actually getting satisfaction and dopamine from doing the simple things, right? I think you probably work with clients who like, maybe they feel stuck. They don't know what they want to do with their life. And it's because they're thinking it has to be this like large grandiose Crazy, passion. Yeah, yeah. Like how about you learn how to get out of bed every day, yeah, yeah, yeah. empty yeah. the trash can. Yeah. Like, so people need to look around their lives because there are, it may, it may seem like simple mundane tasks, just surviving. This NAD but, shit is not a dopamine <laughs> The There's no, no dopamine going on. Doing this one again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it doesn't people, matter if there's sex involved, it's not doing this again. <laughs> yeah. And then from my perspective, people's neurotransmitters are so jacked up because we don't take care of ourselves physically at all. I mean, nutrition, mm -hmm. a lot of these um, neurotransmitters, you know, are made in the gut. People's diets are so mm -hmm. poor. They're protein deficient. There's a variety of reasons, but why people biochemically are just messed up from the get go. But so the, going back to the, the relational thing, uh, which started this, uh, from a doctor's point of view, how would you reinforce relationship? Yeah. Even though you're asking me questions, because I'm always, I'm always interested in, if I wanted to reinforce relationship, if I wanted to have my body help me relate to you, mm. hormonally or chemically, 
how would you do it? Yeah, so I think I think you start with just communication. So for patients like that have poor sexual relationships, we just take that off the table. We're like, let's not even do touch. Let's just do talk first. Mm. Like, can you even talk to your partner? Can you even relay to your partner mm. what your needs are, right? And then once you feel established there, then we move to touch. And when it comes to sexual health, for a lot of women, it's like, do you even understand how your own body works? Mm. Like, Depending how can you even, year, I mean, how can you even yeah. tell your partner what you need or what feels good if you don't even know? Mm. And that's, you know, raising three daughters, I think that comes from a place in society where women are ashamed for, you know, the sexualization of things. Like, um, and so, I, you know, I feel very empowered in that world, having three young girls, like, understand how your body works, like, what feels good to you? Because how could you ever communicate that to a partner if you don't know, mm -hmm. you know, on a singular individual level? So it keeps what keeps people that from... I'm really interested in what you're saying. Uh, what keeps men from, uh, you probably interact with the woman more because they're the- Right, I don't see men in clinic, yeah, yeah. So how do the, how do the women overcome that, uh, the lack of initiation of communication? What do you see? How, how are they not communicating? Well, I think, I think it, you get comfortable. Think about your first year of marriage versus your seventh versus your 30th, mm -hmm. right? People change over time. Ben and I actually renewed our wedding vows after we've been married for 10 years because we were not the same people 10 years ago as we are now. And then we have three kids, you know, careers. And so I think that it's because people get comfortable in their relationship and they assume they know everything about their partner. Mm -hmm. Well, your partner today is not the yeah. partner who they were even a year ago. And things happen in their day-to-day -day life. Things happen at work, right? You don't have any idea what your spouse is doing at work. And, um, I think it's going back to the simple things, just like you preach all the freaking time. Can you sit down with your partner for 10 minutes, turn off the cell phone, no kids, and share? What have been the things that the women that you interact with say that prevents them from doing that? Well, um, I could ask that differently. Yeah, I mean, I think I see Because you're it. in an intimate situation. They're coming to you because they're pregnant, which is mm -hmm. an intimate conversation, or they're mm -hmm. gonna deliver wherever you get them in that yeah. cycle. Uh, where does that conversation ever arise that, uh, man, I don't know how to Yeah, I think, well, I think women are so much more complex than men, especially when we even think about like biochemically, right? I mean, you can say like, well, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, but women um, hormonally every single day of the month, you know, we've got different yep. hormonal levels and these things change the way that we interact yep. with our outside world. And when you're talking about a woman that's going through pregnancy, like I said, their bodies change physically, their mind changes. But this I, this identity, I think there's this like identity of me as a mother, and then me as a wife, and then me as an individual. And I think a lot of women that I deal with in clinic. So you're trying to say you're multi personality? You have a disorder? No. <laughs> but but my brand and like where I come from is that I think as a woman, you really have to figure out how to be the best version of yourself first before you can be a good wife and be a good mother. Whereas I think people lose that identity of them as an individual. And now it's just, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, right? But they well, don't know, the but they don't know who they are. So the, I'm, I'll pose a question to you. So. Especially moms that are stay-at-home moms. I really honestly think it plays a huge difference when you have a relationship where one side of the relationship, you know, provides financially to the household you know, I think people wrap their identity up in that. And that's Most why you see CEOs, men and women, who run away from their home life because... So as a, uh, a strong female, how does a strong female not detract from a male? That's a big question that yeah. I, I may ask it weird, but usually strong males don't like to have strong females around or somebody told them, mm -hmm. you know, have a, a submissive male or female. It never works out that way anyway. Right. Uh, but now you being a strong woman, is it difficult to have, to also empower like Ben or to have that relationship with a strong male? Yeah, I mean, I think it always takes work. We could have Ben on the podcast and you could ask, we should play a game like, what is the marriage game where you ask him on one well, side of the he, wall and then on the other the side middle, of the wall? We'll give him heroin or something <laughs> and make him go down. We'll make fun of him. But anyway. This NAD is making Tom get deep, you guys. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so, Brutal. okay, we'll get out of the relationship rabbit hole. But that was good, that was good. Um, okay, so then how was Three Simple Things born? Unbreakable was first? So Three Simple Things was a, community, a talk around the table. There were six of us seals sitting around talking about what would uh, be left over if they, because there's a big suicide in the military. And we were sitting around, gosh, you know, we're like, hey, are you suicidal? I'm not suicidal. But then the conversation was, if you died, what would be undone? Hmm. And kind of one guy was, uh, he goes, I've had a great life. I don't think I left anything behind. One guy's like, I just retired and I've 30 years, he was gone from his family, 10 months a year for 30 years. He was, if I die, I've never, and he, he has a 10 year old and a 15 year old. He was, if I die now, then I've worked for nothing because I've mm -hmm. worked all this time so that I can now have a family. And he started a family late so that he could retire and then have, a, have that time. And they got to me and I said, man, I've just created this interesting training that I've trained executives across the United States. If I died, it dies with me. They're like, well, then write a book about it. Mm. I'm like, bro, man, writing a book's not easy. It's Everybody can't do it. And I'm like, man, you're gonna make me write a book. So they're like, hey, write the book. So I wrote three simple things because I thought, you know, what would, if I died, then all the technology that I've created would pass with me. Right. And, uh, that, have you ever read your book? No. <laughs> no. Other than the edit, because when you edit it, you have to reread it and reread it and reread it. But now that it's out in its, in its current form, I have read it once, the yeah. final read. Yeah. But when people, when you like ask me about it, chapter seven, I'm like, shit, what was that chapter about? Tom, what's on page 131? <laughs> Is this your book? Are you saying That's you're, not you're my specialty, that? but yeah. <laughs> no, uh, so it was, uh, it was about, uh, um, how life is actually really simple. We've made it too complex. The more chaos that we find, the easier it is to find complexity if you kind of f f get the rhythm of it. And, Humans uh, are really good at making things really well, complex. Make everything too complex, way too complex. And all, what I found to be true is all the, the people who are really good at everything just do the basics. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know anything about labor and delivery, but it's probably pretty basic. Right. The complex stuff that everybody wants to add probably like you were saying the story last night the more you monitor which is a complex thing yeah the more you make bad decisions like birth is very physiological like i'm literally there for when it becomes pathological yeah when it goes stupid yeah but as providers we start slapping monitors on people and giving people medicines and doing all these interventions and making it really complex but uh, part of that too is that people are so less healthy that we've had to make it complex. Oh, really? And so that's the hard part about medicine. And that's one of the things I preach all the time is um, like we're, we're so broken that like I don't even know how to fix it anymore because our, I mean, our healthcare system isn't even designed to fix it. It's just designed to like put band-aids on it. Mm. But um, Which was the, the, the discovery of how complex people made uh, athleticism. It's ex extremely basic. So I said here, if you can, if you can do this baseline physical activity, mm -hmm. you will be a tremendous athlete in any field, uh, but it's people don't do it and you're going and through that's, it now. That's like the one nag I have about like the biohacking world. And I have a whole bunch of people listening and they're like into this, there's a biohackers conference coming up. I'm like, what the hell are you trying to biohack if you can't do the simple things yeah. first? Well, like, so the, what I found to be true <laughs> is, uh, I actually learned these. You can't uh, eat donuts and biohack your way out of it. Okay, I, I'm you sorry. You can't run faster than your donuts. <laughs> let's let's coin that one. So uh, movement essential for all human beings, and actually movement every day is not negotiable. You're not supposed to sit around because mm -hmm. it gives you a different human body if you sit around. So an hour of movement every day, simple, but we've made that too complex. We try to hack that. We try to get the six minute workout. Dude, move. I feel like people one. can't even walk 10,000 steps a day. We have to have a thing on our wrist that counts the steps just for to us. To monitor us. Just to, to see if we got us. there or not. You used to have to walk down to the Denver River and back for water and that was your 10,000 right. steps. But right. an hour movement a day is transformative. That's the first simple thing. The other one is to actually be mobile and stretch. I could say stretch for 20 minutes a day and then drink 10 glasses of water basic 
not hackable, also transformative if mm -hmm. you can do it. And so I put people through a training that you're going through to give them simple and people can't do simple. Mm -hmm. You gotta do simple first. If you can do simple, it solves some of the complex problems that were complex. Mm -hmm. but, but by the time they get there, they're not a complex problem anymore. Like I have pain. Okay, let's get movement first. Let's get stretching. Let's get hydrated. Then maybe the pain isn't as bad as you think it is. Mm -hmm. And so some of the complex problems that we face as human beings in the physical space or the athletic space are more because we're lazy and don't do the basic elements of fitness. And I just know that to be true. Now, so many people I put through training uh, become very athletic. Because if you run, if you were a runner, imagine running an hour a day all the time. That's a, what is that? A, if you can run an hour, that's probably a five mile times, that's a 35 mile week. Yeah. That you're an ultra marathon runner. Right. Don't make it complex. In, in, in school, you actually were doing that. Like if you go to college and you're a runner on a run, you work out for an hour a day. Right. All the time. And that makes you the runner that you are. If you're a football player, it's like a two hour workout. Mm -hmm. But those basics were covered now when we graduate from school. Oh, I took it for granted. Stupid. I was the collegiate athlete and everybody knows this part of my story. Then I got accepted to medical school and was sitting on my tail multiple hours per day and actually had to figure out where in my day I was actually going to be able to move because I was sitting in the library. I was taking tests every Saturday and you lose it pretty fast. Oh yeah. Like real fast. <laughs> yeah. Two years. I, I got injured two years ago and we just did a DEXA scan. And I just put Tom in the DEXA that scanner. I'm, I'm like, I could have told you that you need a $40,000 bit of equipment. We have confirmed all of Tom's <laughs> beliefs in a six minute scan. Yes. Yeah. But you know, so I also, even though I'm uh, uh, in the process of constantly doing simple, things can transform you back to complexity. Mm -hmm. So I also lost some of the things that I was doing that were simple. Mm -hmm. And then every time uh, I put a new class through training, I get back to simple and all the stupid things go away for the period of time. Mm -hmm. Then I forget to do them even as a trainer Yeah, and put on weight. And I go back to doing the simple. It just goes away yeah. without having to go through a weird, you know, program to figure it out. Yeah. And one of the, I even know that. Right. And it's so frustrating. Oh, but even know? well, Doctors are the doctor. worst patients. Like Wait. we, like coaches need coaches too. That's that's why I'm working with Tom, you guys. Um, but I think one of the things that's always resonated in your training is like who you say you are, like is who you become, like what you think you become. And when you get to this point where you're like, I'm fat, like then you do things that fat people do. And it's about changing your language first before the results can happen. I was going to try to hit that conversation, but the the I don't give a shit factor in my chest right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're now still feeling the effects. Hurting. Oh We're my God, my eyes hurt. And it comes in waves, doesn't it? Yeah. You're like, oh, I feel good. And you're like, oh my God, yeah, like there my, it is again. It, it yeah, like I just got another wave. My eyes. I just got another wave. <laughs> okay. All right. Then we'll get out of the deep, dark, deep, dark conversations. <laughs> so how do people find you and how do people work with you? Uh, so uh, the company that we have is called Unbreakable Leadership, and that's the website, unbreakableleadership.com. Uh, and I think we're on social media. Uh, he thinks. Not as, he thinks. I mean, you're, you're a professional. I tell artist. Tom how his I'm social not. media game sucks, like, on a daily basis. If these are just facts. These are not, there's no emotion. There's no drama. These are just facts. But that's okay. But yeah, so uh, Tom Shea on social media or Unbreakable Leadership, we're all over the place, Facebook, Instagram. And apparently this is going Tom to be, has a podcast too. This is going to be posted on Instagram or some <laughs> shenanigans. I have a podcast called uh, Unbreakable, uh, and uh, I, I, I get into discussions about what failing and succeeding is like for yeah. people, with people that have done it. Yeah, it's super interesting. Well, thank you for allowing me to torture you. So I end all of my podcasts, Tom, with something oh, called the good. semen analysis. 
Oh, and dude. yeah, is there a sexual connotation to that? No, or it's my last, last name. name. Okay, I cannot. Good. I can't believe you keep taking this conversation down this <laughs> rabbit hole, Tom. Woo! So I thought we were going to have to analyze <laughs> semen right here. <laughs> Actually, the story behind this is I used to work out at a gym where they wear the heart rate monitors, mm. and you had to give your heart rate monitor a name. Well, I have a good sense of humor. So a, a midwife who was working out with me, she's like, your heart rate monitor needs to say the semen analysis. Oh, so I put it in the computer system and I show up on the first day and the things up on, it's like a giant computer screen on the wall. And oh, I'm like, no. yeah, I don't, well, and first of all, I'm very competitive. So I'm like, I'm gonna make mine go to the red zone, right? Cause then it flashes like bigger on the screen <laughs> and it's like the semen analysis, heart rate 540, yeah. <laughs> um, so I end on oh, my podcast Jamie. with the semen analysis. So um, I'd love to talk about like honoring your word or whatever, but I'm feeling the effects of this in 82. So um, for the semen analysis. Do what do you want to do? No, we so still got 15. We're going to analyze Tom's NAD infusion. So um, <laughs> would you do this again? Which part? NAD. I'm outcome based right now. I can take pain okay. if the outcome is good. Okay. This pain is just. Yeah, so the loading dose, nonsense. like I said, is five <laughs> five doses every other day for 10 days. So we make people <laughs> commit to five because after the first one, God. they start coming up with excuses. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like Tom says, no, I'm excuses all about, are I, subtle, uh, seductive, and I, believable. I, dude, I'm already generating them. I was actually going to get my phone out and start writing some down now. Yeah. Like I was going to have somebody call so I could get out of this. <laughs> 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 As soon as we oh, finish so this, I'm going to open that thing wide open and just get this over with for you. So, well, Tom, thank you for coming on the Fit and Fabulous podcast. So what are we going to do with our semen analysis? What are we going to analyze? Are well, we going to analyze something? We're, we're just analyzing your NAD infusion. Okay, so. I don't, I don't, your brain is working really hard taking up this NAD right now. <laughs> so, but Tom has been so kind. He's actually here in Omaha um, because he's speaking at Keto Summit tonight. And um, I'm super excited for him to share his message with everybody that's attending Keto Summit. So. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you, you. Because Thanks I know you're so. busy and uh, you have a, a life and to fly thank all the you. way out here to Omaha and let me hook you up to IVs is very kind. Just to validate that I'm overweight. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> Thanks for all that. <laughs> you guys, I'm just a truth teller. That's it. All facts. All it's facts. All, all right. You guys, go leave us your review on Apple Podcasts. Leave us your comments, your questions on YouTube as well. Make sure you subscribe to all of our channels so that you can get the updates about future episodes. Thank you so much. See y'all.